Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the November 9th Bull Session 2021. Uh, we're here just to kind of kick around a few things, including sharing my crow lunch with uh, the crowd. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm joined here by Ken Kabula. Say good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon, everybody. Glad to be with you. And Kim will be in and out. I think she might be with us now. Yes, I am. Well, good afternoon. Good to hear you. Well, good to hear both of you. <laughs> All right. So we have been preparing for the COVID cancellation conference that begins tomorrow afternoon. And uh, doing some of our final preparations for the webcasts that will be on starting tomorrow afternoon and concluding Thursday evening. So we'll have a little bit more detail on that. A lot of very familiar names in the crowd, a pretty, pretty reliable bunch of uh, wonderful investors that you are. I want to give one extra shout out to uh, Matt Spielman, who helped out on Saturday morning and gave a wonderful presentation on Green Brick Partners. So thanks again for that, Matt. And uh, I would encourage any, anybody interested in that type of a company to check out the presentation. Pretty comprehensive review. All right, so we'll have our Groundhog update a little bit on the conference. Um, I really did not expect, Ken, to be using the Red Rabbit graphic again so soon. Well, um, neither did I, Mark. I, I thought we'd make it through a month or so before we started <laughs> <laughs> fooling around with the portfolio. But, well, uh, you know, I, this is one of those curses. Um, we have to fool around with the with the small company portfolio a little bit. So, a little more on that in a minute. Um, there are the returns from our successful investing panel sessions. We've been in a little bit of a cold snap, but not too bad. Overall, they stack up pretty well, and we'll talk a little bit about to, that. Do you want to move the slide forward? Because I'm just seeing both sessions. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just all, I'm still on the cover page. Okay. Okay. And My mistake. We'll talk a little bit about S-curves a little bit. All right, so let's get the legal paperwork out of the way. No investment recommendation is intended. This is an educational demonstration. It really is all about illustrating and demonstrating the principles and analytical techniques of the modern investment club movement as we interpret them here at Manifest Investing. Uh, we believe in the stock selection and analysis methodology of the modern investment club movement. And that's what we're here to share. Uh, everything that you hear is an opinion. Please do your own homework. Um, if we own a company that we are kicking around, we'll try to remember to disclose that. Our roundtables happen on the final. It's usually the last Tuesday of every month at 8.30 Eastern time. If you'd like to have a reminder about that uh, webcast, please send an email to nkavula1 at comcast.net. And if you have any follow-up considerations, need copies of slides, although most of you are subscribers, we post everything from these sessions in the Manifest Investing Forum. But uh, if you need, need anything, let me know with Mark R at manifestinvesting.com. Anything you'd like to add, Ken? Uh, Mark, I've been sending out a pretty steady stream of uh, course descriptions, and including URLs for registration. If somebody needs not only information to register yourself, but maybe to send on to uh, a friend, a family member, a club uh, partner, something like that. Uh, if you write to me at kcavula1 at comcast.net, make that a K rather than an N, uh, at comcast.net, I'll send you right back a, uh, a sheet with course descriptions, times, and URLs for registration. And you can send that to as many other people as you wish then. Kcavula1 at comcast.net. Right. Updated live. All right, let's go ahead and go and remind everybody of what is in the bullpen. We've been doing these for a little while. We get together on Tuesdays. The intent is to, on Tuesdays at 2, just simply kick around some stuff that we've been looking at, analyzing, scratching our heads over, uh, perhaps interesting, could be news flashes, all that sort of thing. And I thought we might uh, spend a little bit of time talking about the conference that's coming up, stuff that we are working on, uh, talk about streaking with Bill Miller. Those of you that are, uh, that have some experience probably remember streaking. Um, Ken, did you do streaking in Ohio? Uh, you know, that uh, is after my uh, college days, Mark. 
<laughs> yeah, after my time. I'm really old, so <laughs> we were we were demonstrating and burning buildings. Oh, there so, you go. Oh, that's yeah. Cool. Uh huh. All right. So we will talk a little bit about the the, the best uh, or the better small companies and uh, that portfolio, and we will spend a few moments with S curves. I think we're going to dig much deeper into that subject as we go forward. But here's this morning's news flash. I, I referred to it as a reverse Danaher. Have you had a chance to dig up any more information on this, Ken? Um, no, I'm working on uh, one of the classes for the cancellation conference, and uh, I wouldn't even know that that this was going to happen unless you would unless you texted me, Mark. So thank you so, for the uh, heads up. I'm I'm disappointed to hear that Maria didn't give you a personal call on this one. <laughs> I You're don't listen to Maria very flipping. much. <laughs> well, they are splitting into the three pieces. Uh, I think we should have a, a contest for what will the name of the two other divisions be. Um, I, I already put in one vote for Meta 2, which I don't think is going to be one of them. But it, it's always interesting to see the names that they attach to these uh, spinoffs and situations like this. So... It's an interesting situation. It'll just make uh, life more complicated for GE shareholders. We do hold a few shares of GE here, and I know that Ken does. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh -huh. Many people do. Continues to be. You're not going to mention Icarus for the aviation section, Mark? No, no, that was, that was just, uh, just uh, a passing thought. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's a... Uh, yeah, uh, we'll just let that go with that. All right. Quick commentary on the Groundhog update, and we'll we'll take a look at that. Um, things are going along pretty well in 2021, and uh, although we are having one of our weaker performances in a few years, the ones circled are times when we actually underperformed the Wilshire 5000, and you can see after a streak of four years, those green, the green bar has dipped down below the blue bar, and uh, we still have one quarter of the contest to go, and we have been doing better here over the last few weeks. So we continue to remain hopeful. Bigger picture, we're still talking about 16% versus 10% over the long term, and about 60% of the time um, participants have been beating the market. So we will continue to, to hope for that. But this gives you some context over the years. This is something that we'll be covering at the, the conference also. And just to get this out of the way too, the, the quick update, some of you will recall that the average total return of participants, I think about a month ago, was closer to 2%. And it's actually up to 11. And a few more people are outperforming the market. Kathy Wood continues to struggle, which I find is just amazing because Tesla has been doing very well. But uh, you can see from top to bottom, it's a list that Ken obviously cares more about than I do still. You've been, you've been, you're up to 10th, Ken. I know. Uh, I was even higher than that this morning when I went on the site. So I, well, I'm very pleased, you know. Well, there's some good stuff in the works there. Of course, the, the leading investment club or group entry is the Mid-Michigan Model Club, which is another one of Ken's, as is B.I. Baker. Pretty good race. But we do see Bauer City continuing to lurk there within striking distance, Ken. So uh, we'll try not to jinx you. But uh, well, I've noticed my family club has moved up about 40 places uh, in the last six weeks. So uh, they've been riding uh, a couple of stocks pretty nicely. So it, I, I really appreciate these contests where you can drill down into the portfolios and see what's propelling the portfolio. and. Uh, even more important than these home run stocks, I, I love to look at these portfolios where the entire set of stocks they've chosen is green, is is, is making money. Uh, that to me uh, is a is quite a feat, you know. And uh, we're we're finding those in our contest, and we're finding those in this contest as well. Yeah, it always is a lot of fun. And for example, Bauer City, which is always near the top of the leaderboard. And I happen to know that they only put in stocks that are actually held by their investment club. So that uh, suggests or bodes pretty well for their long-term results. A lot of smiles in Janesville, Wisconsin. Yep. 
and just the the number of uh, names on here just bring smiles to my face. I uh, can't wait till we can see them again sometime soon. All right, moving on. Kim, did you have something to add? I was just going to say, when you said it'd be nice to get to see everybody again, and I'm like, that's what I'm missing the most. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of spectacular names on this list. And uh, we do look forward to that day returning someday, hopefully not too far down the road. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this one. You guys all know the drill. We've we've uh, made a number of presentations on this. Pretty good track record, seven years running. And uh, it kind of inspired me to take a look. I was thinking that Bill Miller uh, had that winning streak of like 11 or 12 years. It turns out it was 15. So uh, Ken is already sitting there thinking, Mark, stop talking about it. We've got seven in a row. We've got a long ways to go to get to 15. So just be quiet. And and get back to work <laughs> without jinxing them. Mark, we, we have a, a couple people wanting to know how you can drill down into those portfolios in the Groundhog Contest. And uh, I think number one, you have to actually have a manifest subscription. Uh, number two, if you go to the uh, sidebar where there's uh, portfolios listed and look for the Groundhog 2021 contest, uh, it is the 21 contest, even though it's going to end uh, on February 2nd in 2022. Uh, and uh, you pull that up and then you click on any of the names and the portfolio behind that name will then appear. Uh, it's really organized extremely nicely, easy to deal with. Uh, so that answers the question for the two of you that asked it uh, to us there. Mm -hmm. I'll try to remember to demonstrate that as we wrap up here. Okay. So as I was kicking around looking for information about, you know, how long had the, the best winning streaks been, and I will follow up with more information on that, uh, Bill Miller being the inspiration at 15 years, um, ran into this nice little nugget of companies, you know, individual companies that have actually outperformed the market every year since 2015. And uh, I find it kind of cool to look at that list from top to bottom, the number of community favorites and uh, companies that have been in portfolios. And uh, Massimo, I think we've been on Massimo for the last 10 years, um, just as one example. So some fun companies there. And, and Ken, uh, you're a, you own shares in Viva, correct? Yes, and and uh, Synopsis down there near the the bottom uh, third of the list. I own shares there. Uh, I used to own Fair Isaac for a long, long time, and and finally did sell it out of an IRA. Uh, and I do own Massimo uh, as well. So that's that's nice to have those long term. Uh, none of these are are spectacular home runs, but they've really done well compared to uh, the, the portfolios that they happen to be in. Yeah, 5.9 is a kind of a Motley Fool. I think it's a Tom Gardner favorite that's done pretty well uh, recently, anyhow. And Centos, um, you, you want know, to talk about boring, but spectacular returns to shareholders, that Cincinnati uh, company. It's uniforms, uniforms. just uh, plain, old, plain old uniforms. Uh boring industrial just happens to treat its shareholders pretty well all right yep. good stuff all right one of the things that we probably will be talking about here in 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 future weeks is i had mentioned fulgent as a a case study of what happens when things go back to the other side of the chasm or the spike the peak um because peloton went through one of those where they actually had a peak in people installing this equipment i think as of just a few months ago, it, it was taking several months if you ordered a Peloton to actually get delivery of one. And uh, that's changing, and apparently it's changing fairly rapidly for some of these companies as uh, some offices are opening up, some people are, are getting back to, to the office these days. But uh, Peloton is an example of a company that's getting stung a little bit. And Fulgent is susceptible to that, and there's a few other companies that Again, you have to think about, well, what happens 
as uh, something resembling normal environment, you know, re-engages. So it's just something to be aware of and something to think about as you imagine what lies ahead for the companies that you're either studying or already own. All right. Well, let's go to Mark's uh, crow on the menu. Um, Houston, we do have a problem. I really didn't expect this to happen in a, a week, but uh, Ken has already made a request for more red cards in next year's <laughs> show. Um, no, no, Ken, I, I, we don't want you to get out of control. You, you're already uh, already raining on my parade way too many times. <laughs> but I probably probably should have listened to this one, especially when Matt Spielman chimes in with a uh, very similar sentiment about the challenges facing uh, e-health as a topic, as a theme. And what you're looking at here, and we've talked about this before, we, we hope to give uh, everybody out there a tool to track relative returns so that it can become part of the alerts algorithm and all that other stuff that we do. But we do track these continuously at Manifest. And these are the 20 companies that we picked. And you'll see that eHealth um, has basically taken a bath and dropped over 30% while the market's gone up 2.4%. 2 now, lest you think that uh, the dis disaster has befallen us, we are still actually at 3 3.5% 3 for the total portfolio, even with eHealth. So... So, Ken, don't be too rough on me, okay? Well, and that's versus less than 2% on the whole market, isn't it, Mark? Right. Well, 2.4. Yeah. That is what the benchmark return is right now, or was as okay. of this morning. So, eHealth has fallen below that uh, time out threshold. So, one of the things that we promised we would do and consider, and I really thought, Ken and I both thought we were going to have more time to think about this, but that time went away, Ken. Um, one of the things that we do with the ten, uh, with some of the other portfolios at Manifest Investing, in some of the tracking portfolios, etc., is we issue timeouts for a selling consideration. Anytime a company drops more than twenty percentage points behind the market, so if the market drops five percent and the stock that you're tracking and studying drops twenty five percent, that would be minus twenty. In the case of eHealth, that you can see at the bottom, it has dropped thirty two. 32.1 while the market's gone up 2.4 so that's kind of an all hands on deck uh timeout situation it's now trailing the market by 34 and a half percent and uh what we will do is we are gonna uh, we can't take it out of the 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 passive the fixed portfolio that runs from halloween to halloween so we just have to um, perhaps say a little prayer and uh, hope for hope for better things. But in the active portfolio, which we track at M1, we will be selling eHealth either tonight or sometime tomorrow and replacing it with something else. So we will take the, the remaining 70% of that position, cash out, and invest it in something else. What are your thoughts on that, Ken? Well, it's just... Uh... I thought we were going to have a little bit of time to come up with a list of uh, alternates, if you will, you know, like uh, uh, the the next three or four stocks that we'd like to see on the list. But mm -hmm. we're going to have to kind of scramble a little bit to come up with some suitable alternates here. I know you have one name to take a look at today. Yeah, the audience gets to watch us scramble here as we scramble here for the next few minutes. Here's what happened at eHealth. Um, they basically missed earnings by a couple dollars not for the year, for the quarter. Um, and if you go back and actually look at the presentation we made just a few days ago, um, the stock price is cratered, as you can see there. Uh, the projected sales for the next one, two, three years uh, has flattened a little bit. You see that up here going from 18 to 13. All right, all this is, not, not even all the analysts have checked in yet on their opinions on the company. Um, this is a real problem. And as we've, we mentioned at least 
twice, if not three times, during the best small company presentation. Um, anytime you have an early stage company or a company like this, and they break through, they break through the tipping point to where they have positive earnings, and they dip back below zero to negative earnings, which these guys seem to be headed for now, they just get punished. And usually get punished pretty, pretty uh, stiffly. And that's kind of the situation we're seeing here. I mean, I think we had an earnings projection closer to $2 for 2021. I'd have to go back and look. And you can see that is no longer the case, according to the, the analysts who follow the company. So you're yeah, we should point. Go we ahead. should point out that uh, that the earnings call uh, in the chart of numbers right there is a calculation coming directly from sales. That's not a projection that we're making to go down to 214 earnings per share. That's just a calculation derived from sales and looking at net profit margins, a number of shares outstanding, tax rates, things like that. So it's coming from a preferred procedure, if you will. And that $2.14 is certainly a, a, a different number than the four ninety five we had just a week and a half ago. Yeah. Yep, not, not fun at all. So. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the company has taken a fairly significant drift uh, draft or drift downward in projected return on value. It's uh, it's just basically a, a mess. And you can see here that the with the net margin dipping below zero, even uh, I believe most of the analysts who track the company are going to have a hard time coming up with perhaps even that 7.5% uh, looking at this situation. So... We will be tiptoeing away from it, and uh, uh, and, and to be really to be really fair to Mark, uh, uh, we noted in our presentation last set or two Saturdays ago, we noted that the trends for earnings had been down, and we we made the the comment that uh, if the earnings uh, stabilize or begin to move up, then this is a, a stock that definitely belongs on the list. I don't think either one of us uh, foresaw the earnings moving down quite as quickly as they actually did in the third quarter. No, in fact, I'll, I'll share a, a tender, loving moment with all of you. I called Ken and I said, well, Ken, they missed on earnings. And he said, well, how much? And I said, I coughed into the phone and said, well, $2. He thought I said two cents or 20 cents or something like that. And uh, obviously a $2 miss on a situation like this, it was actually a dollar eighty, I think, Ken. But I'm rounding down because I'm I'm feeling uh, <laughs> I'm feeling uh, damaged. But it was it was one of those uh, burlesque stutter step kind of things, uh, <laughs> double take. Uh, Fortunately, you know, with twenty stocks in a portfolio like this, and again, let me make the point that it still is beating the market, even with this one in there. Um, so I'm hopeful. I, I am incredibly hopeful and incredibly optimistic. So what I did, in, uh, as Ken was saying, I went in and without regard for size with respect to the uh, amount of sales, went in and looked for companies that have a quality ranking greater than 70, greater than 70, double digit or greater than 12% growth expectations, and then just sorted it by projected return on value, um, wanting to stay again in that above 10 range. So we, we're looking at that list of companies. Keep in mind that some of these were set aside by sheer uh, perceptions of size, uh, including the one at the very top of the list, LGI Homes, continues to look very, very good, but $3 billion in sales is a little bit big for what we're looking at here. So a few names jump off of here. Uh, New Skin Enterprises, I'm still trying to warm up to that story, but I'm, I'm feeling a bit burned here. Um, uh, the Turner, I, I have a lot of faith in turnarounds, and maybe I'm, I'm uh, optimistic to a fault. Um, as, as we were talking about the situation with, uh, I see I've already blocked, blocked the name from memory, eHealth. Uh, a little while ago or this weekend, I said, well, Ken, this basically proves that the company is reliably unreliable. And uh, 
you know, I've always had that optimistic faith in companies like eHealth. And uh, so I'm feeling a little bit burned to go with a, you know, a turnaround situation like new skin, but the numbers across this slate are pretty attractive. So it's probably worth a deeper study. And, you know, some are, some scratching of the head as to whether or not the story makes sense. It's been, been a bit of a transformation. Metafast is another one. What, you know, what a transformation in progress. And I'm not going to say anything more about that because my optimism has already. That's already started. on the list though. Metafast, Metafast is, yeah. is on the list. So you got to yeah, go. Down. I haven't, I haven't worked as much with the list as you have, Mark. Is NESR on the list right now? I don't think so. Is it? NESR? Uh, it's not one of the 20, if that's what you're asking, no. Yeah, no, yeah. I'd, 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 I'd like to dig into that one just a little bit, too. I like the, the characteristics that I see. I don't know anything about the company, and uh, it, it might be time to take a, a, a pretty good look at it. Uh, and, and maybe we revisit, uh, you said you were taking a look at Semler Scientific. Uh, maybe we take a look, although, uh, I found that finding information about what Mercury Systems actually does is extremely difficult. Uh, maybe we take a look at uh, Mercury Systems. Uh, it was on last year's list and was a big disappointment last year, I know. Yeah, that's worthwhile. We, we have a number of people asking, well, you know, what's going on with the company and what can we figure out? Those are actually the three of the names that jumped off the list at me also. Um, uh, a number of these are already on the list. So I did do a little bit of a, a deeper dive check into Sembler. Um This is one that a few people in the audience ha have actually mentioned previously. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into these guys. Um, and who knows? I, I can, I might... I'm going to interrupt for just a second, Mark. And I can assure you, those of you that are throwing shade at the Chinese companies on the list, uh, believe me, we... We had a deep discussion about Chinese companies and whether they belonged on our list or not. And we finally did allow, was it one or two to creep into the list, Mark? Just Green but, Tree. Green Tree. Just green tree. tree. Okay. But we do understand your concern. And it was voiced uh, uh, in no uncertain terms uh, at the, the choosing session. So we'll, we'll just have to wait a year and see if, uh, if the, confidence in green tree was was misplaced or or if it can kind of sidestep what the rest of the chinese companies are have, are experiencing at the moment yeah and so, the numbers the numbers on green tree are, are pretty powerful uh, again our confidence in them is at best shaken but uh th these are some pretty good looking numbers across the board so we did again in a 20 stock portfolio you can tolerate a little bit of uh you know that type of adventuresome moment, you know, without paying too too dearly. Did we lose your mark? I'm. I, can you hear me now? I can hear you. We fine. can hear you now. We lost you for just a moment, okay. Jay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Well, I won't beat the green tree horse to death then. I, you know, it's it's one of those. Okay. So here's a little bit of background on Semler, and I may still bring this one tomorrow or Thursday night. I don't know. But uh, I'm inspired by good medical device breakthrough technologies. Uh, we, have, we have experienced success in investing in companies like Massimo, we were talking about a few minutes ago. And there have been several uh, companies in the medical device arena, especially the one I'm thinking of was the one that was the O2 sensor in the early days. This goes back almost 15 years ago, Ken, you probably remember. Uh, early detection of O2 conditions in uh, especially for infants, infants. for infants yeah. and, and children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would almost put this in the same almost thematic type area. Uh, and uh, I was not familiar with the company. A few people have mentioned it in our community. So that always makes my ears go up. And they're, they're basically just talking about uh, arterial disease. The PAD stands for peripheral arterial disease. And uh, it's one of the precursors to strokes and heart attacks. And uh, early detection in these situations is a really good thing. Early detection in terms of care and diet and exercise and all that stuff is also a really cool thing. 
And that's what these guys make. They were approved by the FDA back in 2015 to do this. We'll take a look at their their sales. And it's a pretty good story with some pretty good uh, implications. And uh, as you can see on the screen there, perhaps as simple as one of those um, O2 sensors that you put on your, your finger. And uh, Kim can probably give a little background on this, that uh, those, are, those are pretty invaluable to have for de detecting early problems with respiratory. Yeah, definitely. All right, here's a look at the company. In terms of their top line, they've been steadily increasing sales. They're running in the 25 to 30% range on, in the growth characteristics. Um, the net margin has pumped up and seems to be stabilizing somewhere in the 25 to the 35 range. So something in this range under those conditions with the number of shares outstanding, and you could probably even use a little bit higher PE if this company really does continue to fire on all cylinders and go up. So this is a very conservative situation. It's not as robust as I would like to see for a situation like this. And uh, fairly, it's a good projected return on value, but um, in not exactly setting the house on fire, it has had a pretty good price correction here in recent days. But you can see your breakthrough moment is here. They have been steadily making progress. Pretty good story all in all, but I think we might be able to beat it. And I agree with you, Ken. We should probably take a look at those two other candidates to see uh, which might be an effective replacement for eHealth in the portfolio. Let's, let's promise to bring those two back to the next bull session, Mark, and make a decision. Okay. So with that, here is the account where we will be taking care of this here. Um, article down on the lower left gives you a, a bit of a review. Um, a number of you asked for this, and we've covered this at other bull sessions. I just wanted to reinforce a lot of people are, are writing to me and are favorably impressed by the, the technology. I've been digging into M1 Finance to, to understand more about them, and uh, I'm pretty impressed with uh, the way they handle stuff. They basically take a basket of stocks. They refer to it as pies. Um, who doesn't like pies? but pies instead of baskets. And uh, one of the things that we have made available to anybody who's interested, you can actually invest in our 20 best small companies directly by using that link up at the top or one of the links at uh, Manifest Investing. Um, full disclosure, we do receive a referral bonus. So uh, for example, a $10,000 investment into this pie or basket of stocks you would receive $150, and so does Manifest Investing. So in, in the interest of full disclosure, um, we do have something at stake here. Here are those 20 companies, and basically you, you would be investing whatever you put in, whether it's 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, whatever, 5% equally weighted into those 20 companies, and this one will be changing here in the next few days. And these were the companies that we covered during our selection show. All right. And just for kicks, I did put up a portfolio, all of the above investing using equally weighted S&P index funds. So you can take a look at that there also. I'm going to begin uh, tinkering with that and trying to emulate the value line arithmetic average, see how well it emulates it over time. Yeah, it's hard to differentiate the colors in that circle, but uh, essentially, this is the 25% small, 25% large, 50% medium portfolios, and we're using uh, uh, index funds to approximate small, medium, and large companies. Uh, not an exact match, but uh, a nice experiment. It'll be interesting to see how it tracks versus the arithmetic average, because uh, the arithmetic average going back over five years, and, and we, you know from some of our other graphics, going back over the long term is uh, in the absence of investing in individual stocks. I mean, I have friends and family that I wouldn't hesitate to to do something like this, you know, with investable funds on their behalf. All right. Well, I'm showing 235. Let's go ahead and close up. We're going to truncate the session a little bit today, but uh, I thought I would take a minute just to walk through this, give the audience a chance to 
express any questions or curiosities that they might have. Uh, for the last month, we've been encouraging community participants to check out the webcast by Brian Feraldi. Down at the bottom, you can Google that. There are the links that manifest all over the place that can actually dig into this. One of the reasons that we wanted to feature this this time of year is we are talking about companies on the left-hand side of this chart um, for some of the best small companies. You know, a little earlier stage, um, the upstreet and parallel stuff is in the middle, right down the middle, and the core basically stretches from uh, left to right in those third and fourth sections, hyper growth and maturity. And uh, keep in mind that for any particular company in any industry, the amount of time and, and some some companies like um, Hershey's, for example, are in an industry that's probably not going to fade away anytime soon. So depending on the industry you're in, that uh, distance or the length of time in any one of these phases is quite a variable. And uh, so for earlier stage companies, uh, Feraldi makes the point that sometimes you might want to use a price to sales ratio instead of a PE ratio. Um, again, this blends very well with some of the work we have done with Amazon and Tesla. We'll be actually building on that work here fairly soon. Again, just to demonstrate how um, the projected return on value probably works earlier in this chart. And uh, again, uh, everything is flexible and variable, and there is some overlap. But uh, I do. Well, and we can go ahead, Ken. And we can make the point also that that decline in the fifth part of the graph on the extreme right is not necessarily inevitable. Uh, contrast that, however, with uh, taking a look uh, at some of the long running indexes and uh, how much the makeup of those indexes has changed over 20 year periods or 50 year periods or, or 70 year periods. Uh, the Dow comes to mind, the S&P 500 comes to mind and uh, it, it's surprising uh, what percentage of, of companies that were in their prime uh, didn't last more than 20 or 30 or 40 years. And they've, uh, you know, they're, they're no longer in the index, a lot of them no longer around. Uh, so while it's not um, definite that that decline is going to occur, it certainly does occur in a, in a large number of the mature companies. Yeah, and I wonder what the th where the three pieces of GE land on this. Uh, never mind. Moving on. <laughs> All right. So here is, again, one of the points we want to make, and we'll make this in spades, I believe, over the next month or so at some of these bull sessions, is taking a real-life example and showing you how the that life cycle, S-curve type stuff, actually does materialize. And we do want to look at companies like Microsoft o over the years, and we'll be talking about Microsoft uh, tomorrow in the, in the webcast tomorrow. But this happens to be Amazon. So you're looking at the revenue chart up at the top for Amazon. And this is, I mean, this is almost, for me anyhow, bone-chillingly straight. That is an 18% trajectory <laughs> for, uh, we're talking about growth all the way back to 1999, for their top line, their revenues or their sales. And, uh, you know, here's some of that hyper growth stage. And then at some point along here, maturity kicks in. I don't know when, when that, what that looks like or when, but they are, they are ultimately on their way to that. Now down at the bottom, you're looking at the earnings. Uh, from 1997 up to 2015, it was pretty spotty. And, uh, they had their their first breakthrough moment back in the early 2000s. Some of us probably remember that. And then you will also probably remember how feisty the Wall Street analysts got with them when they kept dipping back below zero. Everybody here knows about this. Anybody who's ever talked about the P.E. ratio of Amazon being uh, 695, um, you, you know who you are. Because all through this time frame, PEs were impossible. And then they finally did seem to make a move to the upside here in uh, 2014, 2015. And they really haven't looked back. And uh, they really do continue to fire on all cylinders. 
But again, the, it's a pretty good demonstration if we look at the stock price during those times when the earnings were frustrating to, to most traditional investors. Um, again, the point being, this S-curve stuff is not, is not theory. It's not fiction. It, it's real. Here's a look at the profitability over time showing that frustrating period. Uh, all of this was pretty frustrating while we were waiting for them to make profits all, all along the time when uh, Jeff Bezos basically said, I can make earnings be whatever you want them to be. We're building a business here, cash flow matters, et cetera. And uh, the infamous investments made at the round table by Hugh McManus actually occur back in this time frame. The projected return on value, uh, we believe, for early stage companies that are in those uh, second and third quadrants for the right side or the left side of the third quadrant of the life cycle, um, it can be a, a useful gauge of uh, a value for the company. All right. Any comments or questions, Ken? No. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's really difficult when the tail is as long as Amazon's was uh, to, to stick with the concept sometimes. Uh, I mean, there were, were times when I think a lot of people felt that, that the company was never really going to become profitable. Uh, and, you know, I, I know a lot of investors that were in and out of the stock. And uh, I think that that was the time to tell you, to ask yourself, why were you investing in this stock? And I think you were investing in this stock as much for the uh, disruption that it was causing in, in all of retail as you were for the financials that you were taking a look at. So there were, were a lot of reasons why you invested and they weren't all necessarily based on numbers. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if, if you look back in this time frame right here, you know, where they basically were breaking through and having a bit of a tipping point, uh, this is a long plateau. In fact, we're going to talk about plateaus uh, with, with respect to companies like Home Depot tomorrow. Um, that plateau was engineered in this case. Uh, I'm not sure we all believed him all along the way, but uh, they were. But I, I agree, Ken. There are a whole lot of people that were pretty frustrated that uh, the company did not make uh, traditional or conventional progress during that uh, plateau. Well, and and I guess uh, uh, a, we're doing a this. reasonable amount of dead money as well, Mark. You know that yeah that uh, the stock wasn't performing, uh, wasn't doing anything dramatic like it's done in the last uh, four or five years, and uh, uh, it, it, it it's a lesson that I think that uh, a long term investor wants to absorb and remind yourself sometimes. Uh, it's not always the number that's that's forcing the investment. Uh, there's that 25% of your portfolio where, well, you're investing for reasons beyond the numbers. Uh, you know, fill your portfolio with the great growth stories, uh, but leave room for uh, for the stories that that uh, might be disruptors, or leave room for the stories that are just uh, breaking through with. Uh, a business model that's completely different from everybody else's. Uh, it it pays in the long run, I think, as long as you don't go overboard on it. Well, do you do you remember having any similar frustrations with Microsoft? You've been a shareholder since, I believe, nineteen eighty. Oh yes, absolutely. So there were uh, moments along the way, right? There were there were moments along the way, Mark, where I think that the whole. Uh, issue of whether Microsoft was going to survive as as one of the primary providers of of operating systems and software, uh, where that was even going to happen. They were challenged by a number of different companies, and there were a number of times, especially when that stock price was in the 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 30s, that it just seemed to stay in the 30s for a year and a half, two two and a half years. And you had to really ask yourself, why were you holding this stock? And again, uh, it had a lot to do with disruption uh, of society as much as anything else. Well, tune in tomorrow. We're going to talk about the cost basis at the IPO for Microsoft and 
and try to form a guess as to what you think the annualized total return on Microsoft is. And I'm, I'll make a note that we subject Microsoft to the, this very same type of analysis along with a few other key companies and uh, see what it might suggest. You know, the other period that I remember so well was after Bill Gates began uh, divesting his shares. At one time, he owned 30 to 40 percent of Microsoft. And as he as he uh, basically whittled that down, there was quite well, a that can, plateau there also. That contributed to that price plateau market about 36. Yeah. Uh, it stayed in, in that range within a two or three bucks one side or the other for a long, long while. Now, to go back and find that point uh, after all the different uh, dividends and splits and everything is is fairly difficult. But uh, I can remember holding Microsoft in our uh, primary investment club and coming to the meetings and and discussing why the why the darn thing's just not making us any money. Yeah. You know why why do we want this stock in our portfolio? Yeah, Bill and Melinda were flooding the market with Microsoft shares. All right. Let's switch gears to, uh, we are going to be talking about the next couple of days. The stock selection panel is on Thursday evening. This is our track record over the last uh, year and a half. COVID-1 was a year and a half ago. We had a heck of a good time, uh, some fantastic selections, and uh, beating the market by a con fairly considerable margin. Uh, COVID-2 and COVID-3, the, the picks are generally pretty good, but we've kind of gotten uh, hammered by uh do I dare mention uh, emergent biosolutions? Um, <laughs> I, I think I brought that one for two and three. I, I, I'll, t I'll tell you right now, folks, they're not coming back for number four, and that virtually guarantees that stock's going up. Because if I, if well, I avoid it, it's going up. It's an interesting point, too, Mark. When you have a very small portfolio, and these portfolios contain – uh, 14, 16, sometimes as few as 12 stocks. When you have a small portfolio and you have something that's really underperforming the market, and when you're forced to hold it for a period of time, uh, it's going to greatly impact that entire portfolio. There's just no doubt about it. Yeah, and, and COVID-3 was impacted by our delics, and we just hope that that situation uh, winds itself. So go ahead and describe for people what we're doing over the next couple of days, Ken. Well, tomorrow uh, we're going to start out by talking about contests and the, the, the beautiful uh, relationship between ideas that you can act on and the, the stock contests themselves, how they're not only recreational and they're uh, informative, but they can just be a, a, a source of inspiration uh, uh, between the groups that, that participate in them. Uh, we're going to talk about the Mid-Michigan Stock Pickers Contest. We're going to talk about the winners and the losers. We're going to delve into the, the winner's portfolio a little bit. We have a group of women in the thumb that uh, just seem to to have the, uh, the right spirit for coming up with, with uh, emerging companies uh, that are going to do extremely well. Uh, we're going to talk about the Groundhog Contest and how it can be used to generate great ideas. Uh, we're going to show you some results. We're going to celebrate uh, the uh, anniversaries from Mid-Michigan. Uh, this is a Mid-Michigan program, so forgive us if we're Mid-Michigan-centric for eight or nine minutes during that particular class. But all in all, we think we'll leave you with a great list of, of some ideas from a different viewpoint uh, not only some early stage companies, perhaps with no blue line, uh, but also some great uh, classic upstraight and parallel companies that you might put on your list and, and take a look at. Uh, in the afternoon, Mark and Cy and myself uh, are going to sit down and we're going to, the name of the class is 20 questions, but uh, we've discovered uh, at a kind of semi-rehearsal this morning that uh, we all talk too much. So uh, we're, we've kind of uh, whittled it down to maybe 12 questions uh, we can talk about. Uh, we're going to use them as springboards to talk about some, some heavy-duty philosophy about investing. And again, we hope to leave you with some actionable ideas 
uh, on Thursday. Uh, we're going to uh, talk more about small companies. Uh, we're going to cover some of the same ground we covered in our small companies uh, uh, session uh, a week and a half ago, but we're going to cover some new ground as well. I've been kind of uh, searching for some small companies that are even smaller and uh, less less high quality than some of the ones we, we were looking at for our list. Uh, I hope to entice some people with, with some disruptive ideas uh, during that particular uh, uh, session. And then we'll end Thursday evening with our stock panel. Uh, we have Ann Cooney as Director of uh, Education for uh, Better Investing. Uh, she's the second one from left to right. That's Kim Butcher uh, alphabetically on top of the list there. Pat Donnelly on the uh, Better Investing Board of Directors and President of the Pittsburgh Chapter and a great stock picker uh, in his own right. Uh, Charlene Hansen from our Model Investment Club up in Traverse City. Uh, who is a relatively new investor, but has uh, become quite a decent stock picker uh, in, a, in a very short amount of time. And uh, all the respect in the world to Charlene for uh, standing up in a panel of old, old, older investors and saying, uh, I can do this uh, just like you guys can do it. Uh, we're, we're very pleased to have her on the panel. That's Cy Lynch uh, passed my picture there. And Sai is well known. He's on the NAIC Better Investing Board of Directors as well. And then, of course, Mark, uh, who has been to every single one of our stock pickers' breakfast since we began these things 19 years ago. Uh, it wouldn't be a stock pickers putting together without Mark. And uh, we're just so appreciative of all the support he's given us over the years. Uh, I hope that in 2022, we'll be able to gather uh, somewhere in the middle of mid-Michigan and uh, put together 100, 150 people and just celebrate the fact that we can actually eat breakfast and talk to each other again. All right, just a quick reminder that we do archive all of the sessions. These happen to be the visuals for all of the COVID cancellation or successful investing uh, webcasts, all of our or less in length. And uh, you can have, with one exception, uh, the stock panel ran a little bit longer last session, but it's a good one. Even though the results are a little bit slow in coming in, it was a good one. And uh, so you can access those along with any bull sessions or roundtables going back several years. Some details on the, on the other segments of the session, and we'll leave with this aerial view of Taquanaman Falls which is the picture for our, our cover for this November's conference or webcast. So with that, Ken, I think we can just say uh, we, we need to put our noses back to the grindstone and finish getting ready for tomorrow. But thanks again and uh, good Thank hunting out there. Much. Okay, we do have a couple of questions we can cover after we close this session, Mark. All right, take care, everybody.